Commander, hold for O Canada. Our national anthem will be sung by Daryl Castleman, who is a warrant officer for the Royal Highland Fusiliers of Canada. Oh Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all of us command. Catombrasse pour de la paix, he said pour de la croix. Ton histoire est une épopée des bleus brillants exploits. God keep our land glorious and free. Oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Thank you. Color Commander. Sir. Deposit the colors. Sir. Color bearers. Deposit. Colors. Color commander. Sir. March off. On the fence to the right, turn. We'll retire by the center. Quick, march. Please be seated. For those few of me out there, or there that don't know who I am, uh, my name is Bob Ankret. I'm the uh, city liaison for the Royal Canadian Legion, Branch 60 here in Burlington. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Piper, uh, Jeff Swantz. Uh, that's smart looking color guard members, by the way. And uh, they donate their time and energy and provide their own kit for these sort of things. And I think that bears mentioning. The color commander's name is Murray Sutherland, Dan Luzon, Robert Graham, Edward Fitzroy, and Peter Mellison. It's nothing like the sound of bagpipes, I think. I think you'd all agree uh, to set the mood for this kind of event. See this poster from back there? This part that says Nazis quit? Okay, good. That was the front page of the Hamilton Spectator from May 7th, 1945. The question is how do we get there? By the way, I should mention at this point if you did like that, one of the tables out there has a smaller reproduction of that. In June of 1944, young men and women from places like Kamloops, Lethbridge, Port Alberni, Saskatoon, Sudbury, Kingston, Burlington, Ramouski, Sherbrooke, Moncton, Sydney, Yarmouth, St. John's came to support Canada. 
They were our teachers, students, bankers, clerks, cooks, waiters, managers, miners, lawyers, cab drivers, steel workers, lumberjacks, salesmen, plumbers, electricians, bus drivers, and mechanics. The point here is these were not professional soldiers, but they were up against professional soldiers that had learned their trade for the last four or five years. Most of them, though, were our fathers, our mothers, our brothers, our sisters, uncles, aunts, sons, and daughters. They were basically the flower and the future of Canada. For them, it was a time of innocence, but it was also a time of confidence. This evening, it is our hope that through this music, the songs that you'll hear, uh, the photographs, the family stories, the letters, uh, short background or in history you're going to see, we, we hope that you'll see that uncommon valor, duty, honor, self-sacrifice was very common for their time. It's not unusual that when you see stories, newspaper articles, read books, that they call this the greatest generation. And I think you'll agree it was. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, at this point, I'd like all the veterans in the audience, regardless of nationality, regardless of their field of activity, regardless of the country they served in, to please stand, if they would. Now, <laughs> oh, that's what I like to hear. Now, at this point, I'm going to say, those folks who just stood up, there's a fellow, it's pretty dark in here for me, although it feels like I'm being interrogated by the KGB, but the, over in the corner there, if Murray, and I can't tell whether you're going to stand up or not, Murray, but Murray Sutherland, who was the commander for the color guard, if you could meet him out near the veterans' table, just outside those doors, there is a Juno 75 pin for you, and it has been provided by the city of Burlington. So I, I encourage you to go out and have a look. Be, but before we get to the formal part of the, uh, of the program this evening, I'd like to call on our mayor, Marion Mead Ward, to come up and say a few words. Marion? Well, good evening, everyone. It is my honor and privilege to welcome you here this evening. Look at this crowd. This is absolutely incredible. I want to acknowledge all of you for being here. And I also want to acknowledge some special guests that we have with us this evening uh, in elected office. We have representatives from MP Pam DeMoff's office and MP Karina Gould's office. We also have all members of City Council here with us this evening, and I will just call their names. Ward 1 Councillor Calvin Galbraith, Ward 2 Councillor Lisa Kearns, Ward 3 Councillor Rory Nissan, Ward 4 Councillor Shauna Stolte, Ward 5 Councillor Paul Sharman, Ward 6 Councillor Angelo Bentevania. This is a true team and a true team effort this evening. On behalf of myself and City Hall and my council colleagues, I want to first take a moment to welcome the veterans and their families who are here this evening. We are so honored to have you here, and we are so proud of what you have done for us to represent our country, to sacrifice so that we could be free and stand here today the impact that you have made on the freedoms and the security of countless people around the world. Thank you for being here, and thank you for your service. I am so proud of our community. When we first announced this event, the tickets went in a matter of days. Think about that. This room was filled 
months ago because of your interest, through word of mouth, through social media. We had a whole ad campaign planned, and I'm pleased to say we didn't have to spend a dime on that. The people of this city couldn't wait to come together and pay tribute to our veterans to hear their stories and to pass on this important history to their children. And it's absolutely delightful to see so many young people in the audience here tonight as well. This all started from a meeting that I had with a resident, as most good ideas in the community do start from you. She came to meet with me and said, do you know it's the 75th anniversary of Juneau Beach? And do you know the connection that Burlington has to Juneau Beach? And I didn't know the connection that we had. She and a group of uh, people from Burlington are traveling to Juneau Beach for the 75th anniversary events in June, and she told me, you need to be there. And so as we talked, I realized I did, and I will be going there in June, which is why we're doing this event here tonight. So what I learned, and you will hear more tonight, the Juneau Beach Center, in case you didn't know, was brought to life by one of Burlington's own veterans, Garth Webb. And it's... <laughs> It is a wonderful memorial and museum located right on the beach where our soldiers landed for D-Day all those years ago. And many people from Burlington were instrumental in its creation. It was designed by our own architects, Chamberlain Architects. In my conversation with Pam that day, we thought about our local veterans and their families who wouldn't be able to make that trip in June, and how we needed to find a way to come together in our community to honor our veterans. And from that one conversation and great idea, two months later, here we all are. I wanna play a quick video for you of a young lady from Burlington who is now spending some time as a tour guide to Juneau Beach Center Museum. And I think she beautifully puts into words how the younger generations in our community are carrying out this important history and ensuring that it is never forgotten. Hello, and welcome to Burlington Remembers Juno 75. My name is Jacqueline Pitre, and I grew up in Burlington and attended Nelson High School. So I'm proud to call Burlington home. I'm speaking to you, the citizens of Burlington, from Juneau Beach in Normandy, France. So I work at the Juneau Beach Center and my connection with the Juneau Beach Center started seven years ago when I was on a Halton Schools Battlefields tour. So after returning from the tour, I actually got to meet Garth Webb, who was the founder of the Juneau Beach Center and a D-Day veteran. Having met the founder and visited the center, I knew that one day I wanted to come back here and work as a guide. So uh, luckily this year I was selected to work as one of the museum's Canadian guides. So I'll be here until August, 2019, so I'll be here to commemorate the 75th anniversary of D-Day. So I'm really excited to share in the mission of the Juneau Beach Center, which is commemoration and the transmission of memory. Right next to Juneau Beach every day makes me really realize um, the sacrifices that were made here so that we could stroll freely on this beach. Um, so it's funny, when Canadian visitors come here, they're often surprised to see that people sunbathe and swim on this beach. But if you asked a D-Day veteran, they would tell you that they fought on this beach so that one day people could stroll freely on the beach. And uh, that, that's really what they fought for. As part of my job as a guide at the Juneau Beach Center, I get to meet Canadian students and French students. So for French students, they're often, they often ask me, why did Canadians come all the way to France to fight? And they're very surprised when they find out that the Canadians that landed on Juneau Beach were volunteers. And for the Canadian students, it's, uh, it's really surprising when they realize that the young soldiers that landed here were not much older than them. There's actually one soldier uh, named Gérard Doré. He was 16 years old and was killed during the Battle of Normandy. So he was one of the youngest allied uh, soldiers that was killed on the Western Front. So I'm, I'm deeply grateful for the sacrifices that happened on Juneau Beach and to the soldiers that gave their lives. Um, especially this year I get to be here to commemorate the 75th anniversary. So it feels really special to be part of that. 
Uh, tonight you'll also be hearing, you'll be hearing from the Burlington Teen Tour Band, who will be here at the Juno Beach Centre for the June 6 ceremony. And then also tonight you'll be hearing the story, stories from local veterans' families. So I wish you a great evening and uh, thank you for helping to commemorate the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Just to conclude, uh, tonight wouldn't have happened without the efforts of many people in our community and I would just like to say a few thank yous. I want to thank Pam Calvert and the entire organizing committee who put all of this together for their months of hard work and collaboration. And my own staff who are here this evening, Victoria Alsmati, John Bakila, and Anne-Marie Cumber. I want to thank Rob Bennett and the Teen Tour Band for immediately stepping up their involvement. And they'll also be touring in France for the events that are there next month. So it's really fitting for us to get a preview of that here this evening. I want to thank Bob Ankrit our lo from our local uh, legion who is instrumental in so many of the details of the program that you're about to see this evening and is doing a great job as our MC. Thanks to Danielle Manton and our team at City Hall who have masterminded much of the work behind the scenes. Ed Dorr, the chair of the Burlington Mundialization Committee who is always ready to lend a hand and the team here at the performing, Burlington Performing Arts Centre. I also want to thank all of our exhibitors in the lobby and make sure you check them out on your way out. I want to thank the Burlington Symphony on the Bay, who provided the instrumentalists as you walked in this evening. Thanks to the Color Guard and our Piper and our singers Daryl Castleman and Hannah Bailey. Thank you to Dr. Michael Brechtold of the Juno Beach Center Association and the veterans' families who will be speaking with us shortly to share more history and memories. And I also want to thank the many local businesses who have donated the delicious treats for you to enjoy later this evening. It really does take a village to make something like this happen, and that village came together. I want to thank you all for being here tonight, for helping to honor and remember our veterans here in Burlington. You make me proud. I'm back. <laughs> thank you, Marianne. Um, to tell us what was happening from a historical point of view, I'm sure now most of you are kind of aware of it or you wouldn't be here, but just in case. Um, give us a historical view in June of 1944. Uh, we have Mike Bechtold here. Mike is the executive director of the Juno Beach Center Association and a historian of the First and Second World War. Uh, Mike, are you out there? Good evening, everybody. I bring you greetings from the Juno Beach Center, and I want to spend the next few minutes telling you a little bit about what D-Day was. June 6, 1944, was perhaps the greatest invasion in the history of man. It was a day where the Second World War was perhaps decided. Before that, things had gone very badly. Everybody knows about Hitler, the most monstrous tyranny that had ever visited Europe. D-Day was the beginning of the end. It was the chance to fix everything, a chance to bring freedom back, a chance to end the Holocaust, but it took a lot of effort on that day. I think a lot of you know about D-Day from this movie, Saving Private Ryan. Steven Spielberg has done a wonderful job telling the story of a small group of American soldiers that landed on the 6th of June and fought in Normandy. Um, perhaps that first 20 minutes of the movie are the, uh, the best war film that you'll ever see. Highly recommend you watching it. But you're not going to learn very much about Canada from it. 
It's an American story, and they do a great job of telling their story, so we have to do a great job of telling our own story. So I'm gonna talk about that a little bit tonight, and you're gonna hear more from the families of some of the veterans that were there. So, Normandy was a place that was selected as the ideal place to land. It wasn't the closest place to France from the United Kingdom. That would have been the Pas de Calais, the Straits of Dover to the cities of Calais and Boulogne. That was the place the Germans expected us, so we didn't go there. We went to a place called Normandy, a little bit farther, but it had a lot of opportunities for the attack. It was a complex operation. Men from many nations were involved in the, t the attack. It started with airborne soldiers from the US 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions landing on the eastern flank, and then British airborne uh, men landing on the western, the eastern flank, um, and that included men from the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion. 550 men uh, landed there. There were two American beaches, Utah and Omaha. Utah was perhaps the easiest story on D-Day. It was uh, relatively lightly defended and American casualties were quite low there. Omaha, that's where Saving Private Ryan took place, was the most dangerous of the beaches on that day and the Americans who landed there suffered the highest casualties. Bloody Omaha, as it's known. At one point, it looked like the, uh, the Germans were winning and in the uh, attack at that beach was going to have to be called off, that the uh, troops would have to be recalled. But the American soldiers persevered. They fought their way up the, the bluffs. They made it to the top, and minute by minute, and soon hour by hour, they were winning, and uh, the invasion continued there. The British had two beaches, uh, gold and sword, that uh, flanked the Canadian beach, Juneau and Juno's what we're gonna talk about for the next few minutes. The fact that Canada had a beach on the 6th of June all to themselves is a really uh, quite phenomenal story of success for the Canadians. During the First World War, the Canadian Corps was perhaps the best fighting corps on the Western Front, uh, beginning at Vimy and carrying through to the last 100 days of Amiens and, and the battles to end of the war. The, the Canadian Corps did a, a, an amazing job in ending the First World War and that reputation carried on to their sons who uh, were part of the 3rd Canadian Division and 2nd Canadian Armoured Brigade that landed at Juneau on the 6th of June. Um, the fact that the Canadians were given a beach says a lot about the British view of our fighting power, of our competence, of our ab ability to get the job done. The, uh, the men of the Canadian 3rd Division wouldn't have been asked to do that if they weren't up for the task. And even more importantly than that, they were given probably the most important role uh, amongst any of the assault divisions on D-Day they were uh, equipped to defeat any German counterattack. Everybody was pretty sure that they were going to be able to land in France. The big question was, would we be able to stay in France? The Germans had a lot of very powerful armoured divisions filled with Panther tanks and Tiger tanks. And uh, the German strategy was to counterattack immediately after the invasion. So the planners had looked at the terrain. They uh, looked at where the Canadians were landing. And that was probably the most favourable terrain for that kind of an armoured counterattack. So 3rd Canadian Infantry Division was prepared for that. They were given extra anti-tank guns, more artillery, extra men to deal with that. And the attacks came starting on the 7th of June and carrying on for the next three or four days. And the Canadians stopped them. They stopped them dead in their tracks. One of the most elite German divisions, 12th SS uh, Hitler Youth Panzer Division, was stopped. And the Canadians did that. I like to say that if it had been an American or a British battle, Everybody in the country would have known about it. There would have been songs written and movies made, but we're Canadians, and we seem to be far too uh, modest for that kind of a thing. Um, Lieutenant Henry was the commander of a Sherman Firefly tank, and he knocked out five Panther tanks um, on a battle on the 5th of June, sorry, the uh, 9th of June. Uh, it was a, an attack that should have won him the Victoria Cross, the British Commonwealth's highest award for valor. But it didn't, and afterwards, his commander was asked why he didn't nominate it, and he said, he was just doing his job. That's what we expect him to do. So Juno Beach is about eight and a half kilometers in length. There's three major villages along there, uh, Courseul, Bernier, and Saint-Aubain. Uh, there was five assault regiments that landed uh, in the forefront of the attack. The Royal Winnipeg Rifles and the Regina Rifles at courseul sur mer uh, The Regina's landing right in front of the beach where the Juno Beach Center is today. Um, in front of uh, Bernier sur mer the Queen's Own Rifles of Canada, a regiment from Toronto landed. They took the heaviest casualties of any Canadian D-Day regiment, um, over 100 men killed um, on that day. And uh, a little farther to the east, the uh, North Shore Regiment from New Brunswick, 
attacked between Bernier and Saint-Aubin. Um, they got ashore. Uh, Juno Beach was the second uh, most heavily defended sector on the entire uh, Allied beachfront right behind Omaha, but they got ashore and they did it. This is a, a really important quotation as far as I'm concerned because a lot of people before the attack thought that with the overwhelming Allied firepower that was going to uh, drench the German defenses, that maybe the troops would just have to walk ashore and take possession. They had heavy bombers, they had medium bombers, there was fighter bombers, there was battleships, cruisers, destroyers, uh, armed landing craft. They even had uh, landing craft with self-propelled guns that had them strapped down and they were firing as they approached the beachhead. Nobody could survive that, right? Well, the Royal Winnipeg Rifles War Diary tells a different story. Um, I think they're maybe exaggerating when they say the bombardment failed to kill a single German soldier, but it gets at the fact that D-Day was won through the courage of the average soldier, the average Canadian soldier who had to drop out of their landing craft, storm ashore, and fight through the defenses. German machine guns, mortars, minefields, barbed wire. Um, it was a vicious fight, but the Canadians persevered and they prevailed and they won the day. But it came at a cost, uh, came at a very high cost. 340 men who landed on Juno Beach died during the initial assaults or later on that day. Another 19 men of 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion were killed during the drops uh, along the Orne River. And another 22 men, um, members of the Royal Canadian Air Force, died while flying for Canadian or British squadrons on D-Day. So a total of 381 Canadians died to make D-Day a success. The historian in me makes it an imperative that I share this slide with you. Um, Dwight David Eisenhower was the Supreme Allied Commander of the D-Day landings, the man in overall charge of uh, what was happening on the 6th of June. And after the battle, this note, the one you see there, was found in his wallet folded up. And I'm just gonna read it to you quickly. Our landings in the Cherbourg Hav area have failed to gain a satisfactory foothold and I have withdrawn the troops. My decision to attack at this time and place was based upon the best information available. The troops, the air, and the Navy did all the bravery and devotion to duty could do. If any blame or fault attaches to the attempt, it is mine alone. Eisenhower didn't know if D-Day was going to be a success. We know today it was a, a massive success. We know today that D-Day was the start of the end. We know that after 76 days of fighting in Normandy, the Germans were defeated, and by May, uh, some nine months later, Hitler was dead and Germany was done. D-Day was a success. The men in the, the landing craft that day didn't know that. Eisenhower didn't know that. He was prepared to announce to the press that D-Day had failed. So we have to keep that in mind. I think we have to remember the, the turmoil, the trepidation, the fear that these men had in amongst themselves. Every one of them, every one of the Canadians who landed was a volunteer. They volunteered to go, they chose to go. It was their decision to be there because they knew it was such an important job that they had and they went and they did their job and some of them are still there in Normandy today. So thank you very much. Um, if you have more questions on, on D-Day or the Canadians, we've got a table at the, uh, in the, the lobby and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mike. What Mike didn't tell you is that before you leave here, you will have to write a paper. Um, it's multiple choice, but it is 50% of your final mark. So uh, I hope you all paid attention. Uh, when we were putting this together, um, we, we have some veterans that were there on uh, Normandy. Uh, and we have a lot there aren't. But the families of those people have a lot of information. Um, and I think what we should say at this point is anyone who's in this room that's been in service would understand you have two families. You have the family at home, and you have the family in service. And if you're 20, 19, 17, 22 years old, and you're in another country, uh, that service family becomes very important, but you still keep in touch with the family at home. Uh, what we've done is, when we, we first looked at this, I talked to some of the families of some of the veterans I know, and what we decided to do is to bring out the families to talk about uh, the people that were there. And that's what we're going to do today. 
what I'd like to do is introduce uh, Kate, the daughter, and the grandson, James, of veteran Jim Warford to speak about Jim. Kate, James. Dad wanted you all to know that he was disappointed and sorry that he could not be here in person tonight. He asked us to thank you for honoring the 75th anniversary of D-Day at Juno Beach with your presence here in the theater tonight. So his name was Alfred James Warford, uh, Jim to most of his friends and all, everyone who knows him now, and don't you dare call him Alfred. <laughs> he was a sergeant in the Royal Canadian Army Corps, 35th Army Troops Compass and Company. Originally from Hamilton, Ontario, he enlisted on the 3rd of October, 1941. Jim's basic training started in Newmarket, Ontario, after which he transferred to Lake Megantic, Quebec, where he attained the rank of sergeant. Jim then moved to Valcarche, Quebec, and was assigned to the 6th Division Ammo Company. In camp, he was the company physical trainer, continuing in his history of athleticism and leveraging his passion for track and field. It was in Valcarche that he learned to ride the motorcycles that he would use overseas. Jim's company was eventually assigned to home guard duty in Vancouver, where he met his soon-to-be wife, Patricia. Staying on the home front, however, was not his plan. Jim felt the call to go over there and chose to drop down to the rank of corporal. As a result, he was soon reassigned to active duty, and he immediately proposed to Patricia. They were married on December 28, 1942, and spent their honeymoon on the troop transport back to Hamilton. He would go on to earn his sergeant's stripe back. Once overseas, his first assignment was in Heath, England, as quartermaster in the company stores. It was on D-Day Plus Two that Jim finally touched French soil for the first time. At that time, he was in charge of a a platoon of lorries driving ammo to the frontline troops. From France, the campaign moved steadily through Belgium and into Holland to participate in the liberation of the Netherlands. After this, it was a brief stint in Germany near the close of the war in Europe. When peace was declared on May 8, 1945, he went back to Holland where he would spend the remainder of his time before coming home in February of 1946. So when asked about his memories uh, of the war, the first one that came to mind for Jim was uh, his time dropping off ammo at the front lines. So my grandfather was in charge of 10 trucks and their job was to load up, uh, drive the ammo to the front lines, dump it off, and then drive immediately back for the next run. Uh, it wasn't uncommon for the traveling of the convoy to take over, place over long periods of time, uh, 12 hours, 14 hours, and so on. And most often uh, that travel was done during the night. So Jim would ride his motorcycle up and down the line of trucks, bringing, uh, uh, bringing all the vim vigor of a, of a soldier in his, in his young 20s and banging on the truck doors just to keep the truck drivers awake because the, when they're dodging the, you know, the Germans at nighttime, they basically had to make sure that they were staying awake for very long periods of time on the, on the road. And it was during one such time uh, that he recalls uh, being shelled by the Germans. Uh, and it was such a, a brutal bombardment that they had to crawl underneath the trucks and dig furiously in the dirt below the trucks to wait out the storm. It was one of the scariest moments uh, of, of the war for him, and it's a story that I heard over the years many, many times. There were good memories, too. Memories that helped sustain Jim's morale and ones that he would keep close to his heart long after the bad ones had faded. One such time was during the liberation of Holland. He and a chum were billeted with a Dutch family for Christmas. The family had two children, a boy around 10 and a girl around 12 years old. Their parents had nothing to give the children as presents as the Germans had stripped the country bare during the occupation. Jim and his friend decided to give them chocolate bars as it would not just not do not to have a present at Christmas time. The gratefulness of the family and the children's joy at the gift was something to witness. Other mem memories stuck with him over the years, like the time they helped arrange a hockey game between his company and a Dutch team, and when he get, got to talking with some members of a local soccer team and found himself invited back to their place for a home-cooked meal. 
War may be hell, but in amongst the bad, there are often moments of peace and happiness, and within these, opportunities to be had. Upon his return home, uh, Jim got a, do a job at Stelco in the mills and was promoted to the industrial engineering department, uh, where he worked for the rest of his career. Following this, he turned to coaching baseball and later track and field as the head coach of the Legion Track Club. In addition to this, Jim was a long-standing member of the Burlington Volunteer Fire Department uh, for 25 years. He and my grandmother, Patricia, had wanted to be teachers, uh, but like a lot of veterans, the war happened and life took a different curve. Uh, it should stand as no surprise that his two daughters uh, followed in their footsteps, though, and became teachers themselves. Uh, in his retirement, Jim stayed active as a, both a member of the Legion and the Navy Club, which he held dear to his heart. Um, and five years ago, he and I were able to attend the uh, celebrations for the 70th, 70th anniversary of D-Day in France, and a year after that, uh, for the 70th anniversary of the liberation of the Netherlands. It was a profound experience, and it was also the very first time that he was over there uh, since the war. When asked about what message he'd, he'd like to give the youth of today, Jim replied, war is not fun, it's hell. What you see on television or in the movies often does not pr portray it properly. So in closing, uh, we were asked to leave you with the portion of the St. Crispin's Day speech from Shakespeare's Henry V. Um, it's a part that, part that perfectly illustrates the bond between soldiers who have survived uh, during times of war. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he who today sheds his blood with me will be my brother. Be he near so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England, now abed, shall think themselves accursed they were not here. And hold their manhoods cheap whilst anyone speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's Day. Thank you. Wow. I think it's important to see as we move forward that to qualify some of these people's lives, it wasn't just liberating countries and coming home. It was building your country. Uh, 75 years. What did they do? They came back and used those skill sets and the things they learned to build Canada again. And I think they did pretty well. What do you think? Now, those of you who know me know I know Jim Warford very well, um, and he's well-liked. So well-liked, by the way, that the Minister of Defense, he had nothing to do, uh, came to Burlington to visit Jim at Joseph Brandt Hospital, which was, believe me, quite a big surprise to the security team at Joe Brandt. <laughs> anyway, um, I, they just didn't listen. Um, so, uh, and the reason he came was we weren't quite sure whether Jim was going to be healthy enough to make it to Juno with the Teen Tour Band and various other people in June in France. So that's why he came. But I'm just wondering, Jim is, will be 96 years old on August the 16th of this year. Uh, he's in 6 South in room 122. And I think if we cloud, clap la loud enough I think he's going to hear us. What do you think? <laughs> now, I'd like to introduce you to someone uh, called Dee Dee. And Dee Dee's going to talk about her father, veteran. Fred Davies, Distinguished Flying Cross. Dee Dee? Hello. Um, as Bob said, my father is Flight Lieutenant Fred C. Davies, DFC. He was in the 408, then the 405 Pathfinder Squadron with the Royal Canadian Air Force Bomber Command. He was born 1923 in Halifax, Nova Scotia. He died about five months ago, November 28, 2018. May 6th, today, 
he would have turned 96. Happy birthday, Dad. Fred joined the RCAF in Halifax when he was 18. He flew most of his operations from Granstead Lodge England Airfield, initially in the Halifax, then the Lancaster. He joined Bomber Command. One had to volunteer for this unit as lifespans were rather short. His initial sorties were bomber runs to take out identified targets. He became an expert at navigational radar. As a pathfinder, his main role was to go in advance of the main force, find their target, mark it with flares, and get out of the way of the hundreds of bombers following behind. He flew 45 operations over France, Belgium, Holland, and Germany to complete his tour of duty. For this, he received the Distinguished Flying Cross, the DFC. Normally, after a tour of duty, soldiers go home. However, he and his crew did the unthinkable, and they volunteered for another operation. They could sense something big was building. May 25, 1944, their Lancaster was shot down over Holland while returning from Germany. The pilot died in the crash while the rest parachuted to live on. Fred and one mate landed near each other and made a two-week journey through the Netherlands and Belgium with the aid of numerous underground safe houses. He was captured near the French border and became a prisoner of war. Most of his time was spent at Stalag Luft III in Poland. The great escape occurred there shortly before his arrival. January 27, 1945, he, along with many of the other 11,000 POWs from that camp, were moved by train or on foot about 30 kilometers a day under horrific conditions in a haphazard route to avoid the advancing Soviet troops. U.S. armored tanks under General Patton liberated them near Munich, Germany on April 29, 1945. He returned to England on May 6, 1945, his 22nd birthday. Dad never really spoke about the war when we were kids. He reminded us that loose lips sink ships. When the 30-year prohibition expired under the Official Secrets Act in Canada in 1975, Dad got involved with the POW, the RCAF, Legion, and other groups to share information. He also reached out to underground groups in the Netherlands and Belgium to aid them in planning should war ever break out again. It wasn't until the mid-90s when he completed a factual memoir of his wartime experience that he began sharing stories with us. Dad was touched by the selflessness of the underground who helped him evade the enemy. He made a point of visiting each of the homes where he had been sheltered to meet the elderly people or their children and personally thank them. We were introduced to them all during an emotionally charged 2012 family trip that traced my dad's journey from parachute landing to capture. Dad loved to tell of an elderly German guard he felt sorry for, who reminded him of his own grandfather, staggering under the load of everything needed for a forced march. He and some prisoners carried the rifle, packs, and pushed the bike to help the guard along so he wouldn't be shot for failing the Reich. When an SS German officer in an approaching column was seen, they quickly reassembled the sick guard. They laughed from both relief and the speedy antics they had just gone through. Dad also told us some of the scary stories of the drunken enemy officers playing Russian roulette roulette with their prisoners. Dad narrowly missed his turn when a drunken guard was called away just as the revolver was pressed to his forehead. Dad said at several events that he would like the youth of today to remember that you don't really understand war until someone is shooting at you. He said war is hell. 
Don't believe anything you see or hear that romanticizes war. However, you can add compassion to the war by how you treat others while doing your job, and he embodied that. Fred came home from the war, traveled Canada, met his wife Anne in Toronto, and grew a family of five children. He volunteered as a cub, then scout leader, to train boys to become self-sufficient leaders. Dad could do everything he set his mind to. He was an early adopter of new technology, including going to college to learn how to program desktop computers in the 1980s. He volunteered helping the elderly until he was in his, in his 90s. He continued speaking at events and schools until he was 94 as part of the Memory Project. Dad was a generous person and would help anyone and everyone who needed help, whether it was with his time, his knowledge, or his money. Thank you. I knew both of these gentlemen, and what both of them have left out, and I'm sure our mayor would attest to this, that when we had an event, whether it was Remembrance Day, whether it was the Dutch royal family coming over, planting of tulips, the Vimy Oaks, anything, you just had to ask them, and regardless of health, weather, age, they were there for us. So they were true Canadians in the truest sense, not just during wartime, but during peace. So I just want to make sure people know that. Um, our next speaker is uh, Andrew Barber. Andrew Barber is the Vice President of Friends of the HM HMCS Haida. And he's going to speak about veteran Lieutenant Commander Hendry. Sir. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, Bob. <clears throat> My name is Andy Barber, as was mentioned. I'm a Korea War veteran, Naval veteran. And today I have the singular honor of paying homage to Lieutenant Commander Gordon Henry, who was part of the D-Day Juno Beach landings. He, along with more than 125,000 other troops that were part of the D-Day landings at Juno Beach and other beaches, exhibited the courage and the steadfastness that led to the eventual defeat of Germany. He was born on February the 20th, 1921 in Montreal, and subsequently moved to Burlington in his later years where he raised a very loving family. He passed away a little ways over two years ago at the age of 96. <clears throat> Gordon was a member of the historic Canada Memory Project, and as such, he visited schools in Burlington and other service clubs and related this story about the D-Day landings to the school children and other organizations in the Burlington area. He was in command of a landing assault craft, LAC, at LCA 736, which ferried the troops to Juno Beach from Her Majesty's ship Prince Henry, which was a mother ship that transported the troops from England uh, to, drop, to their drop-off point just off of Normandy. In his book, Rare Courage, Veterans of the Second World War, he described what it was like aboard his landing ship as the troops disembarked. He wrote, as our eight landing craft filled with troops went toward the shore, all hell broke loose. All the big ships, every ship that had a gun, were starting to bombard the shore to try and soften it up for us for the landing. <clears throat> On the way to the beach, the water was quite rough, and unfortunately, the boys were seasick. But a wonderful thing happened. One of the sergeants got up on the top deck and started to sing, roll out the barrel. And we all joined in, he said. And just for a moment, 
the fear on the boy's face has left. And we were all smiling. As we arrived, we could see these mines that if we hit them, would be blown us, we would be blown as smithereens. He went on to say, just think of how the boys felt. Seasick, packs on their back, being splashed with machine gun fire. I hesitated to order down doors, but it had to be done. They jumped into the water. Some were up to their waist, and two of the shorter lads never came up. So that was a pivotal moment. Lieutenant Commander Henry's life and what he never forgot. These attributes that he had of leadership, courage, compassion, were traits that served him very well, both in his business community as well as his family life. His son John related a story that showed his esteem that his father held in the community. He said on June 6, 2012, he and his dad set off for D-Day ceremonies down at Spencer Smith Park. His dad was confined to an electric chair by this time. And as they ventured along Lakeshore Road, an OPP cruiser pulled over and said to them, where are you going? He said, I'm going to the D-Day ceremony at Spencer Smith Park. Well, another cruiser pulled up alongside. And the two of them, with Lieutenant Commander Henry in the middle, brought with their mass lights flashing, brought them to, to Spencer Smith Park in the ceremony. Such was the impact that he had on the community that these officers recognized him in closing, it is right and proper that your Tamanic Commander Gordon Henry should be recognized here tonight in his adoptive city of Burlington for his courage shown at Juno Beach 75 years ago and for his excellent contributions to the community over his lifetime. And I thank you very much. Wow. Um, David Schottlander would now like to talk about his father, Gordon. David? Hello, everybody. Winston Churchill once said, we sleep safely at night because rough men stand ready to visit violence on those that would harm us. It's a real honour to be here tonight representing my father, Gordon Schottlander. He is joining us here in the audience. Gordon was born in London, England in 1925. Today he is a strong, vibrant, 94 years young and a true war hero. But to my brothers and I, he was just a dad. He never spoke about his bravery, his heroism, or the loss of his friends and comrades. He never spoke about the unbearable suffering he witnessed and endured. He never once raised his voice in anger to remind us of his sacrifices and the sacrifices of so many men he stood beside in the trenches. Not once. Why? Because to him it was a different time and a time he didn't want to haunt him and he never let it. Dad joined the army in 1942. Hardly the rough men we envision in Winston Churchill's quote, he was a 17 year old boy. He was assigned to the Royal Berkshire Regiment, and a year later, in 1943, he became a commissioned officer. On June 6, 1944, Gordon landed at Normandy on Juneau Beach with the number eight beach group, part of the 5th Battalion of the Royal Berkshires, alongside the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division, close to St. Aubin. For two weeks, he fought fiercely until he was wounded on the advance of Carpaquay and Cane on June 20th. He then returned to England. 
In early 1945, Dad was sent to Belfast, Northern Ireland, and was with the Royal Ulster Rifles. It was here he met his wife and my mother, Colleen, at an officer's mess party. They were married in 1946 and spent 65 years together. We lost Mom nine years ago. In 1947, Gordon volunteered for service in Sierra Leone, West Africa, in the Royal West African Frontier Force. After that, he returned to England and left the Army as a captain. Dad recalls a time when he was stationed in England close to the Canadian troops. They often met in a local pub. After a few beers, the insults started flying. Crazy, stupid Canucks, loser limeys, and much worse. They usually ended up in a brawl where the Canadians generally won. But when he saw how seasick the Canadians were on the D-Day boats, he forgave them. After all, he says, the British are sailors as well as soldiers. Little did Dad know he'd become a crazy Canuck himself when he and Colleen came to Canada in early 1950. Gordon's service to the community didn't end with his military career. He continued to serve his community here in Canada. Some of his main, many accomplishments include President of the Junior Chamber of Commerce, cha uh, Chairman of the Board for the City of Burlington Planning Board for eight years, Chairman of the committee that raised over a million dollars for the Burlington Family YMCA. He was the Burlington Citizen of the Year in 1968. And he served with the Knights of Columbus for many, many years. If that were not enough, Gordon, who is now 94 years young, has contributed to the population growth with four sons, 16 grandchildren, and 18 great-grandchildren. Way to go, Gordon. <laughs> The youth of today thankfully and hopefully never will understand or experience what that 17-year-old boy lived through. We are truly grateful, Dad, for what you have done, the sacrifices you have made, the strength you have shown us all. We are who we are today because of you. My father's words to the youth of today, work hard, be true to yourself, remember your heritage, and love your country. Gordon is an amazing father and an amazing man. And my father is right over here if you'd like to stand up, Dad, because I think you deserve a round of applause. We love you, Dad, and thank you, everybody. Now, you all heard our mayor talk about Garth Webb. Now we have someone here, Don Cooper, is going to speak about Garth. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't see a single person out there, but I know there's about 700 of you. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Uh, we at the Juno Beach Centre truly appreciate all the support we get and that we've gotten from the beginning. I want to say a few words about Garth. We are really here today largely because one man had vision, perseverance, and passion. One man wanted to create a lasting memorial to Canada's World War II veterans and their contributions to our freedom. One man wanted to tell Canada's story. That man is Garth Webb. On the morning of June 6, 1944, Lieutenant Garth Webb, along with my father, Sergeant George Cooper, landed on Juneau Beach in Normandy with the Canadian 14th Field Regiment as part of the Allied Forces. Despite experiencing significant losses on D-Day, his unit continued their advance over the months that followed through northwestern Europe and eventually Germany in 1945. And I remember my dad telling the story that after three days of without sleep after they had landed, they basically were down to about 30% of the uh, manpower they started with. And then they heard some bad pipes, and they were ready to go again. The result of Garth's vision and perseverance in telling that story is the Juno Beach Centre, Canada's World War II memorial and museum in Normandy, France. 
Garth passed away a little over six years ago, and this year being the 16th anniversary of the opening of the Juneau Beach Center, and the 75th anniversary of D-Day, has allowed us to mark it with a special tribute to Garth. Part of that story is how Burlington was ground zero for all the work that was done. The Juneau Beach Center Association head office was on Woodward in Burlington, and Burlington architect Brian Chamberlain, who's here in the crowd today, designed the building. The whole project was, in fact, driven out of Burlington. So thank you, Burlington. <laughs> Garth entered my life in 1994, when he was a young 76 years old. And that's a point to remember that at 76 years old, he started this project and finished it. He met my mom, and it became a part of our family. He was really my second father. I remember Garth for his generosity, his wit, and his love of sports. He was never at a loss for a story to tell, a poem to write, or words of encouragement. Little did we know back then, in 1994, that Garth would lead us on an incredible journey called the Juno Beach Center. It has become his legacy, and a legacy that was left to all of us. So I'd like to take you back to the early days of the Juno Beach story in memory of Garth. Around 1996, during French and Dutch battlefield tours by Garth and Lees, Garth complained about the lack of a fitting Canadian memorial to World War II. The Americans and the British were getting all the credits. It was like we weren't even there. Garth didn't think the Canadian story was being properly told, and he decided he was going to do something about it. Now, we all know how the story ended. But in 1996, the goal was fuzzy, and the path was certainly full of uncertainty. Garth set the vision of the Juno Beach Center as a World War II museum and memorial from the beginning. It was a grand vision that encompassed Canada's total story in World War II and the story of Canada since. Garth started by recruiting a small band of dedicated supporters, and I was one of those. He talked to the mayor of Bernier sur Mer, and we had verbal support for land on Juno Beach at Bernier, where Garth and my dad George both landed. There was an idea of using a small abandoned railroad station as our museum. Garth planned on getting some deep-pocketed benefactors, Conrad Black was mentioned, to write our organization a check for one or two million dollars. With that money, we were going to build our museum and tell the story. It was going to be easy. Garth worked for two years and sent out dozens of letters to potential supporters to try and get support. Two years later, there was no benefactor, there was no money, and there were lots of doubters. But we had a lot of supporters as well. Despite these disappointments, Darth didn't give up. A small army of supporters committed to the project, and we started accepting small donations into the 14th Field Regiment Children's Association, our regimental charity. And the journey began. Garth never lost faith, was always willing to dream bigger. He was a tireless promoter and chief fundraiser for our cause. There were lots of board meetings and regular kitchen table meetings between Garth, Lees, and myself, and Garth was the eternal op optimist in that triangle. And thanks to my mom who made it out tonight, so we've got two parts of the triangle here tonight. It's just Garth that's missing. There were lots of setbacks. One of those was the time we were informed by the town of Bernier that they wouldn't give us their support or the land that they had promised. So we went a few kilometers west to Corsos or Mare on Juno Beach and called on the mayor. We were met with open arms. Mayor de Morgue stated that Canadian blood was shed on Juno Beach and he could do no less than give us the land we needed. That land at the time was a camping site that was cherished by the campers and uh, Mr. de Morgue put up with a lot for his decision. It was a very courageous decision by the mayor at that time. Thanks to the town of Corsos, or Mayor, Mayor de Morgue, and thousands of Canadian and French supporters, Garth Webb made the Juno Beach Centre part of our collective heritage. He set the bar high and he pushed us over it, over it. Garth isn't here to push us forward anymore, but he has left us great memories and a lasting legacy. He has shown us what can be achieved with dedication and determination. The story isn't over. During the next five years, our efforts will be to secure the legacy of the Juno Beach Centre for all Canadians. Our great success 
has seen us receive 45,000 visitors in the opening years of 2003, and now moving toward 90,000 visitors in 2019. We're going to grow beyond that number of visitors, and we need to expand the Juno Beach Centre and enhance it to respond to that growth. So thank you very much for coming. Thanks for your support. We couldn't have done it without you. Onward and upward. Thanks, Don, for uh, talking about Garth Webb. I think uh, that, was, that was an important uh, talk. Now, behind this curtain, how many of you know what's behind this curtain? The band? Okay, you're good. I'll say that, you're good. The Teen Tour Band is conducted by Francis Smith, and he's going to play some music that was broadcast in 1944 to our men and women in uniform uh, from a BBC program called Sincerely Yours, hosted by Vera Lynn. This evening, the band is going to play some Glenn Miller selections. They'll include The Mood, Tuxedo Junction, String of Pearls, Little Brown Jug, and my personal favorite, Pennsylvania 65000. But, Francis, before you start, I have a question. I understand you have some sort of, uh, and I found this out a couple of days ago, uh, some sort of uh, new form of identification uh, for your trip to Normandy in June. W what would that identification be? What are you pulling out there? What's, what's that? We have dog tags celebrating every um, fallen soldier in Benny sur mer Cemetery in France. And the band. Sorry, sorry, there are. We have dog tags for every fallen soldier, uh, Canadian soldier buried in Benny sur mer Cemetery in France. And every one of them has a, has a Canadian story attached to it. And the band is researching those and compiling something. Uh, to be shared at the Juno Beach Center. So every one of these band members that's attending Juno Beach has a story and a legacy to take with them, and I think it's remarkable. Thanks, Francis. Ladies and gentlemen, your teen tour band.
So how many of you wanted to get up here and jitterbug across the stage? Okay, my uh, hands up, me, okay. Or how many of you had your foot tapping after about the first 30 seconds? That was me, yeah. All right. Um, from 1939 to 1945, the Royal Canadian Air Force sent out many letters to families uh, of service people lost on missions. And some of you may be aware of this, but the attrition, meaning the planes and the crews that didn't come back, reached 50%. It was quite high. Uh, this is about, we're going to have some letters here. And the first part is about one such airman. Uh, Dave Stempen will read three of those letters. Not all of those letters ended as this one. Ladies and gentlemen, Dave Stepan. Number 405 Squadron, Royal Canadian Air Force Overseas. Mrs. M. Davies, before you receive this letter, you will have had a telegram informing you that your son, Pilot Officer F.C. Davies, has been reported missing from air operations. On the night of 24th, 25th May, 1944, your son, along with his crew and other members of this squadron, were engaged in action over enemy territory. Unfortunately, his aircraft failed to return from the operation. It is a sincere wish of all of us that he is safe. Your son was very popular with this squadron and was an excellent bomb aimer. He is greatly missed by his comrades and his loss is regretted by all. There is always the possibility that your son may be a prisoner of war, in which case you will either hear from him direct or from the Air Ministry who will receive advice from the International Red Cross Society. Your son's effects have been gathered together and forwarded to the Royal Air Force Central Depository where they will be held until better news is received or, in any event, for a period of at least six months before being sent to you through the Administrator of Estates, Ottawa. May I now express the great sympathy, sympathy which all of us feel with you in your great anxiety, and I should like to assure you how greatly his comrades in the Royal Air Force admire the heroic sacrifice your son has made in the cause of freedom and in the service of his country and the Empire. If there is anything further I can do for you at any time, please do not hesitate to write me. R.J. Lane, Wing Commander, Squadron 405, RCAF. June 10, 1944. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Davies, at this time of great sorrow, it is felt that you and the members of your family will wish to know the circumstances surrounding the honor and distinction which have come to your son, Pilot Officer Frederick Charles Davies, DFC through the award of the Distinguished Flying, Flying Cross prior to his having been appointed to a commission for great gallantry in the performance of his duty while serving with number 405 Squadron of the Royal Canadian Air Force prior to his having been reported missing. The citation on which this award was made reads as follows. This airman has completed many successful operations against the enemy in which he has displayed high skill, fortitude, and devotion to duty. The personnel of the force are proud of your son's fine service record. Yours sincerely, Minister of National Defense for Air, Ottawa. Mr. F.V. Davies, dear Mr. Davies, confirming my telegram of recent date, advice has been received from the International Red Cross Society, quoting German information which states that your son, Pilot Officer Frederick Charles Davies, is now a prisoner of war. It is a pleasure to convey this further information as I feel it will relieve to some extent the great anxiety endured by you and the members of your family. Attached is a leaflet giving particulars of departments and organizations from whom you can obtain advice and assistance, together with a few notes regarding personal effects, promotions, etc. May I again assure you that any additional details received at these headquarters will be communicated to you immediately. RCAF Casualty Officer for Chief of Air Staff. Thank you, David. Now, you're quite right what you're thinking. Have I heard that name before? Yeah, you did. Uh, 
that was Fred Davies, Distinguished Flying Cross, that Dee Dee, her, his uh, daughter, had spoke about earlier. Now, I should mention, we talked about the families earlier, the home family and the, and the regimental family, or the flight family. Um, three months went by between those letters. Is he alive? Is he dead? What do you do? There's no body. What happens? And that's what these people had to live through, just to remind you. At this point, I'd like to welcome Sandra Jennings to the stage. Dave and Sandra will, lead, will read some letters exchanged between a very new husband and wife. She is in Canada, and he is not. The letters are an insight into the lives of two young people separated by war. See what you think. April 21, 1944. My darling wife. Hi, Skipper, dearest. Here's your Jim once again, loving and missing you with all his heart and soul. I'm yours and yours alone, my Pat. Well, honey, it's been some few days since I've written you, but we've been so very busy. We've moved, but of course, I can't tell you where, but we're here. We've been so busy packing and making presentations that at preparations that I just haven't had time to go to sleep at least until two or three in the morning, and believe you me, honey, I'm all in. Well, it seems that old Jerry is really finished now. The Russians at his back door, our bomber force going over stronger all the time. It won't be long now, gorgeous, before we're together again. Well, my Pat, it is now about 2.30 a.m., and we've just finished unpacking the last of the stores. So I'll close and write a longer letter tomorrow. Remember always, darling, I love you, and I'm yours and yours alone. As always, your loving husband, Jim. Chin up, keep smiling. May 11th, 1944. Dearest Jim, another busy day at work. I came home and I was so surprised by your letter from you, my darling. I'm glad you got my parcel. Imagine 13 letters from little old me, all in one day. Did you make all the other fellas in the camp jealous, honey? At night, Kay and I went to the shore, saw the Frenchman's Creek. It was very good, honey. Came home and was so tired. Good night. I love you so much. June 6, 1944, D-Day, my darling wife. Well, Skipper, dearest, the day is here. This morning our boys landed in France. I hope it's not long before we got them. I won't be long now, darling, before we're together again. It'll be hard going over here for a while, but when they crack, they'll crack fast. Look at the way we're going down in Italy. I must spend the rest of this page telling you of my love. I love you so very much that it hurts to be away from you. You're my wife, my everything. Always know, gorgeous, that I love you and you alone and always shall. As always, your loving husband, Jim. Chin up and keep smiling. June the 6th, 1944, D-Day. Dearest, D-Day has come, and my reaction, well, I'm too choked up to even express my feelings. God speak to all the boys so we can be together as one. We received word this afternoon while I was downtown with Mum. I sewed later on in the afternoon, then took Mum and Rhett to the shore tonight. And it was a good one. Good night, and I love you. July the 3rd, 1944. Dear Jim, oh darling, at least we have a letter from you written on D-Day. Thank God you are not over there yet. I'm alive once again. Did a washing this afternoon and had tea next door with Mrs. Hunley. Tonight I stayed home and wrote letters and did some ironing. Good night and I love you. July 13, 1944. My darling wife, Hi, Skipper, dearest. Here's your Jim again, loving and missing you with all of his heart and soul. Well, honey, we've moved up forward and are stationed in a wood. We've had to dig way down in the ground as Jerry'd been over a few times and none of us want to get machine gunned. Don't worry, honey, if any of our planes, their planes come over, there'll be about 10 of ours after him. One came over this morning and was shot down in a field near us. The artillery fire has really been going strong all last night and today, just a steady rumble, and in a field next to us are seven German graves. The towns we passed through coming here had taken quite a pounding. There were signs of battle everywhere. 
We haven't seen a lot of French people yet, but those that we have seen are friendly and cooperative. There are salvage dumps all over the place with German and our equipment in them. They're sending the mail from over there very fast, but it will be slow from this end. Well, gorgeous, I must close now. Loving and missing you so very much. As always, your loving husband, Jim. Chin up and keep smiling. July 21st, 1944. Dear Jim, I got a cablegram from you today, my Jim. It was swell, but oh, how we were worrying as to the why and the wherefore of such. Mum and I had all our work done by 10.30 a.m. and went to town in the afternoon. Tonight, Rhett and I went cycling and stopped for a coke and met two soldiers from home, that being sailors from home. Good night, and I love you. August 3, 1944, my darling wife. Hi, Skipper, dearest, you're Jim once more, bringing you, I hope, happiness in a few pages. I love you, honey, with all of my heart and soul. I'm yours and yours alone. The news today is very good. The Russians moving like a steamroller, our boys moving forward both in France and Italy. I'm finally convinced that the Jerry's will fold up in two months' time. Wouldn't that be wonderful, hun, being together again? You'd better get plenty of sleep the night before I arrive back, because you sure aren't going to get any in the night I do. <laughs> Tonight we had an ENSA show here. Yep, a real live stage show. It was very good. Tony, that's Sergeant Stacy, was chosen to go up on the stage with a gorgeous blonde while she sang a song about a sergeant. I had a camera with me, so when she had him up on the stage, I snapped a picture of him. Can I ever blackmail him now? <laughs> I took the picture too soon, because later she planted a big kiss on him. Did he ever blush, or did he ever blush? Boy, was I jealous. Now, honey, I wouldn't have let her kiss me. I would have kissed her. <laughs> well, gorgeous. <laughs> Well, gorgeous, once more, it is time for me to close. Au revoir, darling. I love you more than life itself. As always, your loving husband, Jim. Ch chin up and keep smiling. August 21st, 1944. Dear Jim, Monday was wonderful as I got four letters from you today. Though they were written in July, it was still wonderful to hear from you. At night, Will Rett and I took baby Ellen to the show. Was she ever cute, hun? Got a letter from K2. The news we are getting is so good, sweet. The war must surely be over soon. Good night, honey, and I love you. September 6, 1944, my darling wife. Hi, Skipper, dearest. Once more, tis your lord and master. Oh, gosh, bringing you his love and all his latest affairs. Received a letter from you today written in Stratford. Yes, honey, they sure are swell people there. I knew that you and Uncle Will would get on good together. I'm sorry Stuart wasn't there. He and I used to have some great times together. Well, gorgeous, we moved forward again last night. The spot we moved to is in a little valley, and it's surrounded by quaint and picturesque little villages. Jerry was here three days ago, and quite a tragedy happened after he left. A German officer was shot by one of the local people, so they took 17 Frenchmen, made them dig their own graves, and shot them. Well, honey, I must close up for now. Remember, I always, I love you with all my heart and soul. When we're together again, my dreams will have all been realized. We'll write again as soon as time permits. As always, your loving husband, Jim. Chin up and keep smiling. September the 18th, 1944. Dearest, oh, what a horrible thing to have happened. Oh, Jim, please take care. I worry so. Those poor people. This war has to end, and you have to come home to me. Hung around the house today and then went down to the CPR office and got my letter. Met Joyce at 4 p.m. and had supper. Came home and went to the show with Uncle Will and saw Lucky Jordan and twin beds. Good night, and I love you so. May 8, 1945, VE Day, my darling wife. Hi, Skipper, dearest, here we are together on VE Day. The King has just announced tonight the complete cap capitulation of the German army. I just can't seem to believe it, gorgeous. We all stood around the radio and listened to Winston Churchill speak at three this afternoon. 
There were tears in many an eye, and in each handshake there was gladness. I can't explain to you my feelings. To know that I've come out of this alive and unharmed, to come home to you complete, to have all our dreams come true. I love you and can't wait to be with you again. I can't think of anything but this feeling. I love you. The war is over. I love you. Well, honey, it is now about 2 a.m. and I'm tired, but I want to be with you. Do you mind if I close for now? Tomorrow night will be a long letter. We'll reminisce of days gone by and days to come. I love you more than life itself. I'm yours and yours alone. As always, your loving husband, Jen. Keep chin up and keep smiling. May 8th, 1945. Dearest Jim, it's here, darling, the day we have been waiting for on VE Day. I am so happy I could burst. Vancouver went wild. Oh, darling, I am so thankful for everything. We were at Edith's this morning and again in the afternoon. At night, Eddie and Harold were here, and we had a lot of fun. Oh, I'm so tired. Good night, my love, and I'll see you soon. June 8, 1945, my darling wife. Hi, Skipper. Once more, your Sarge, bringing you all his love and kisses. I do love you, Pat Gorgeous. Love you with all my heart and soul. We have coming through our point a German prisoner of war camp. It is English guards that bring their trucks through, but they usually bring one or two of the Jerry's with them. Those Jerry's haven't had lived so good for a long time and won't for a long time to come. They come through with a smirk on their face, and the boys don't hand the meat and other foods to them. They just about throw it in their faces. I saw one instance of it today. The Jerry was on the back of the lorry and expected our boys to carry it out to him, but he was sadly mistaken. Our issuer took the meat and carried it about 20 yards further away and made the Jerry walk after it. Well, I guess that we'll all be voting pretty soon. That guy King will never get my vote for me. I think myself that the only party is any good for labor is the CCF, and they'll get my vote every time. At the same time as they're holding the federal elections, those of us from Ontario get another vote, as it's our provincial election also. Well, Pat, dearest, I'm almost at the end of this letter, and I guess I've taken up enough of your time. So I'll close, but not before I tell you once more of my love for you. I do love you, Skipper, with all my heart and soul. I'm yours and yours alone. As always, your loving husband, Jim. X, 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 you know what those are. <laughs> Chin up and keep smiling. December the 31st, 1945. Dearest, and so we celebrate the new arrival, and what a time. 23 of us all over at Franz. Oh boy, home at 5.15 a.m. Pop came and got us at 2 a.m., and naturally, we didn't leave at that time. Doggone it, but I wish my man were here. News about you, though, honey, was such wonderful news. You will be on your way home in January. Phone mum around midnight on New Year's. Golly, it was wonderful to hear her voice again. Good night, my love, and I can't wait to be with you again. February 9th, 1946, my darling wife. Hi, Skipper, dearest. Once more, you're Jim, only from Canada this time. I love you, darling. Love you with all my heart and soul. When I spoke to you on the telephone the other day, I wanted to reach right into it and hold you in my arms. I can't believe it's true that in a few short days, we'll be together for all time to come. Dad and I were in down, down today to look book for Vancouver, and it will be, in all probability, Wednesday that we can leave. That's the best we can do, dearest. Remember, I want you and much as you want me. Know this also, honey, that I love mom and dad very much, but it's you that counts. You're everything to me. If it means your happiness or mom and dad's, I'd choose yours. The first night home, dad was fairly high, and I was kind of mellow myself. In auntie's room, there must have been 40 people if there was one. Frank's, Frank's Joyce is anxious to meet you. In fact, everyone is waiting for their pet. God, darling, we have so much to make for, and I'll bet we catch up on it, too. I've got to say much to you that when I first see you, I won't be able to speak. I'll probably be too tongue-tied. 
We'll drop another line tomorrow. So till then, good night, dearest. I love you more than life itself. Your loving husband, Jim. Ladies and gentlemen, Dave and Sandra. It's, was it me or any of the gentlemen in this audience, although Jim Warford is in the hospital and he will be 96, would like him to write your letters home to your loved ones? Because, <laughs> man, I, I would. That, that, that was pretty good. Okay. Um, I'd like to now introduce... Uh, Hannah Bailey and the Teen Tour Band. Miss Bailey will sing a 1940s wartime classic made popular by Vera Lynn called We'll Meet Again. Hannah? Well, I've heard Hannah uh, sing that song before, and I don't know about Vera Lynn, but I think uh, it should be uh, uh, Anna Bailey's uh, keynote song there. It was uh, pretty good. 
Very good. Well, ladies and gentlemen, our evening's coming to a close. And on behalf of the veterans and their families, I'd like to thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, from the people presenting on stage, to the musicians, uh, to the technical support we've had in this building, to City Hall for uh, the mayor lending us her family room, and uh, the Chuno Beach Association, and to the people providing the food outside, uh, and the people who work at the display tables. But I think there's one person I've forgotten, and her name is Victoria, and she's right down here with her family. And over the period of only two months, uh, I think she's talked me off the ledge about four, maybe five times, okay? So we didn't need any first responders, so thank you, Victoria. Um, but before you go, and outside those doors, yes, those doors back there, the uh, food and drink and some interesting displays, um, what we're going to do is, it's about, oh, about almost 8.15. Um, the Juno Beach Center Museum has provided a 12-minute film for you this evening. It's called They Walk With You. And this film's only been shown twice in private viewings, and it's a powerful film uh, that utilizes the Second World War newsreel footage, uh, dramatic rec recreations with actors uh, to convey the role and sacrifice of your fellow Canadians, uh, all about what we've been talking about tonight during D-Day and the Battle of Normandy. Uh, those that are interested in seeing this film, uh, please reconvene back here in your seats in about 15 minutes at 8.30 because we're going to have one showing at 8.30. Now, I should mention to you, this is a war film. So the reason we're not showing it now is may, it may not be suitable to younger viewers. So as they say in TV, viewer discretion is advised. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, on behalf of the veterans and their families, good night and thank you and safe drive. <laughs>